AKA presents Jim Beatty. Designer and builder of new types of airplanes for general aviation. His sensational bullet-shaped BD-5 has become one of the most publicized sport airplanes ever introduced. Here, on videotape, he discusses topics common to all aircraft design. This session is on airfoil selection. Picking the right airfoil for your design is really quite important. There are many other things that you have to worry about in designing an airplane that are critical. And the airfoil selection isn't the most important one, but it is quite critical. Because if you pick the right one, you might be able to have a very definite increase in performance of your airplane. Or if you pick the wrong one, you may end up with a situation that you have a serious problem, a flying characteristic problem, that may be difficult to eliminate and in some cases may be impossible to eliminate. So it's quite important to understand what are involved in airfoils, what do they do, and what you should be looking for. There is no one perfect airfoil. If, if there was one that would give you all of the right results and, and perfect in every condition you want, then we wouldn't have to worry about the big catalogs. Then we'd have that one perfect airfoil, we'd use it on all airplanes, and that'd be the end of it. But that isn't really the way it works, unfortunately. Each airfoil section has certain little characteristics to it that give the designer the opportunity to optimize a particular characteristic of his airplane if he wants to. The early airfoil sections were actually just come about by random in, in all reality. Way back in World War I, uh, there was a series of airfoils laid out called the RAF airfoil sections. Uh, many of you who built model airplanes or World War I type airplanes might recognize them. I'll give you a little example of that right here on the board. These airfoil sections were relatively thin, but they had a little peculiar characteristic in that they seemed to have a little curve here with some sort of bumps. Now the reason for that was that the RAF at that time figured that all airplanes needed two spars, both with the top and bottom wing, and they thought if they made a very thin airfoil that would fit between these two spars, they would have the right results. So that's why it has this little extra under camber on the thing, strictly because they had to fit between two predetermined spars and laid it out. Now you can see that airfoil section was not laid out for any real aerodynamic reasons, it was laid out for some practical construction reasons. Later on, NASA, or NACA at the time, came up with a series of airfoils that we call the four digit and the five digit. For example, a 4412 is a good example of the four digit series, it's very popular. And then we had like a 23015 as a five digit airfoil section. Now these airfoils were laid out with a series of mathematical plan, you might say. No real aerodynamic reason for it. Really what it was defining was the amount of camber and the shape of that camber to the cord line and whether it was a second degree equation or third degree equation and so on and so forth. They just came up with a nice systematic way of laying out streamlined shapes that we would call airfoils. They built models of these, put them in a wind tunnel, and found out how they acted. The ones that were no good, they just threw away and forgot about. And the ones that were good, they studied more carefully and finally published the shapes of these things and the results of them. Without going into a lot of details about the theory of airfoil sections, and all, which you can get from a lot of textbooks, uh, I do want to cover a couple of critical uh, elements about an airfoil design. For any airfoil we have, we're going to have a cord line. And a cord line is defined as the straight line from the tip of the nose to the very tip of the tail. The distance halfway between the upper and lower surface will be called the mean line. And if it isn't like in this particular case, curved and above the cord line, we say it has camber. Uh, the thickness of the airfoil is also a very important type of thing because it defines the uh, amount of area you have to build a spar and the volume you might have if you want to put fuel in there. And the four digit and five digit series, these two sets of numbers on the four digits and the first three numbers on the five digits 
defined the camber line. Again, let's not get involved in all of the details why that is the case. But in the last two, these digits define what the relative thickness is of the airfoil compared to the cord. In this case, the 12 would have meant that the thickness of the airfoil section is 12% as thick as the length of the cord would be. And in the case of the 15, it would be 15% of that thickness. Now, in laying out these different airfoil sections that NASA had done, and incidentally, uh, the, the four digit and the five digit series uh, really became the most popular ones in the world. There, there were other con countries who had done design work. There were other uh, research facilities that did it. None of them really came up with any airfoils that were any better or, or more used than what the NASA series would be. But in about 1940, uh, NASA dis discovered that there were some real critical things in controlling the actual design of an airfoil. Instead of just by mathematically varying different shapes and putting them in a wind tunnel, they found out that if they would look at something specifically and determine how that shape would, would come up with the kind of results they wanted, they could come up with a whole new airfoil, and that became the beginning of the laminar airfoil sections. And what we're talking about here is the fact that in most airfoil designs, you'd like to reduce the drag if you could. Uh, that's a critical thing because most of the time what you want to do is have your, your airplane go as fast as it possibly can. And the amount of drag that the airfoil itself creates is, is a pretty important factor of it all. Well, the very, very thin layer of air that is right up against the skin of the wing initially is what is called a laminar airfoil flow section, and then later it becomes turbulent. Let me give you a little better example of it here on the board. I'll draw what would be a little bit larger airfoil section this time. And we will find that as the air approaches the wing and starts to flow over it, the very early portion of it, providing the wing section is relatively smooth, the thin boundary layer of air, and when I say thin, I mean really thin. Uh, let's take a wing of a normal light plane with about a four foot cord. If you would be using a laminar airfoil section on it, the boundary layer at about quarter cord or 30% cord will be about the thickness of a dime. Now by the time it gets to the trailing edge on this four foot cord, it might be as much as a quarter inch thick. But this is the thin little layer of air that is actually touching the surface and is rubbing against itself. If we would look at an exploded view of the thing, we would see that the layer of air flowing on here, not doing this as artistically as I'd like to, but in any event, it might give you an example of what we're saying. These would be velocity vectors. Uh, in other words, out here is the free stream, and that might be 80 miles an hour, whatever particular speed the wing is flying at. The very thin layer of air rubs against the surface and slows down. If each layer is really nice and smooth, we would call that a laminar section. I think sometimes if you've ever seen anybody take a cigarette and put it down in an ashtray and watch the smoke come up. Initially, the smoke comes up very, very straight, very smooth. Lines are just beautiful. Then at a certain point, it starts to become turbulent. Well, the same thing happens on an airplane. This wing section here will have this laminar airfoil for a certain length of time, and then for some reason, we don't know why, as it builds up across here, it becomes turbulent. And a turbulent boundary layer will be, oh, four or five times as thick as the laminar boundary layer. But most important thing is that it has a lot more drag to it. A laminar boundary layer has one-seventh the amount of drag that a turbulent boundary layer is. Now, this is not stalling. Now, don't, don't get this turbulent boundary layer confused with flow separation or something like that. This is the very thin layer of air that's touching the top and the bottom of the wing, rubbing up against it. All these molecules are hitting the surface, rubbing against it but the turbulent boundary layer has seven times more drag. So it became real obvious once we knew that, that the thing we'd like to do is get this transition point where it goes from laminar to turbulent as far back as we can. And what was the trick in doing it? Well, they found out that as long as the pressure gradually decreases as it goes back, keeps getting lower and lower and lower, which means that the air has to speed up as it's going over the curvature here. As long as it's doing that, it will stay laminar. And then soon as the pressure starts to increase and the velocity starts to slow down, it'll trigger itself off and become a turbulent boundary layer. So the trick was now to lay out a predetermined pattern of pressure from the nose to the tail. And once you had that pattern laid out, then you could go back 
and mathematically determine what kind of shape it would be. And that's where the laminar airfoil sections came up, the 64, 212 sections and stuff like that. What NASA then came up with was a series of these laminar airfoil sections of which the 64, for example, 415 was really the most popular type. I'll make this a 65, 215 to show you what I'm saying here. This six represented the six series of these laminar airfoil sections. There was a one, there was a two, there was various others, but the six series really became the good ones and the real popular ones. The five represents about what percent of cord back that the pressure gradient was favorable for a laminar boundary layer. And in this case, it would be roughly 55% or 50 back. The next three numbers represent first, the two represents the degree of camber that the airfoil has, and the last two numbers represent the percent of airfoil thickness again. In this case, 15%, just like the other ones were before. The two, without going into detail what the two number really means, it's important to remember that if it's a zero, for example, zero 015, it has no camber at all. If it has two, it has a little. It can have a three, a four, or five. It's about as far as I've seen them go is, is six, like a 615. That has a lot, a lot of camber in the wing. We'll get to the reason why you want camber, maybe why you don't want camber. In the case of these first two digits here, the 65, for example, there was a very popular series of 64s, 65s, 66, and maybe even 67. Now, obviously, the 64 meant that the laminar boundary layer went back to the 40% cord position. This had a reduction in drag compared to anything else, but not as good as the 65, which would go back to 50%, and not as good as the 66, which would go all the way back to the 60%. So your quick question is, why not always use a 66? Well, one of the things that happens is, you will get this laminar boundary layer if the pressure gradient is properly designed like this, also if the surface is very smooth. If, on the other hand, you have rivets or cracks or some other little uh, disturbance on it, it will trigger that laminar boundary layer off and make it go turbulent right away. In a 64 series, for example, it's not really too sensitive. It can tolerate bugs, it can tolerate some little cracks in the paint, various other things, and still maintain the laminar boundary layer. But when you get to 66, it is quite sensitive. Almost any type of bug on there will start to trigger it off, and then you lose your whole effect of your laminar airfoil section. So it's a compromise. If you want maximum drag reduction, use the 66. And maybe, for example, like in a high-performance sailplane, that's what you'll do. But you better clean that wing very, very well before you go to use it. And when you're flying, you better hope you don't run through a swarm of mosquitoes or some kind. If, on the other hand, it's a good general aviation-type airplane, you want some drag reduction, but you, you don't want to be so sensitive, you don't want the guy to have to go out every morning and, and wax the leading edge of the wing uh, super smooth before he goes fly. The 64 series becomes quite good. The BD-4 design that we had, for example, we used a 64-415. That turned out to be 15% thick, nice and thick for a good airfoil spire, I mean, build in there. Uh, four for the reasonably decent camber for fairly nice high lift, and a 64 to give us laminar flow, but not a real sensitive one. As it turned out in the field and in the operation, we ended up with a real good airfoil section, which I would say a 64-15, for example, had probably about half the amount of drag, if not half, at least 40 or 50 percent drag reduction of a normal five-digit or four-digit airfoil section you'd have and still have all the other advantages. A lot of times uh, you'll, you'll hear comments being made in magazine articles or, or some of the textbooks that if you use a laminar airfoil section and it gets dirty, then it's just as bad as the rest and it'll always get dirty anyway, so why bother using it? That isn't really true. You can get a lot of benefit out of it and rarely, rarely will cause you any real problems compared to the other airfoil sections. Only in certain instances would you want to use a four-digit or five-digit series. Another critical thing in determining the design of the airfoil section, besides drag reduction, is the stall pattern itself. Now, actually, there's, there's a, a variety of things. Stall pattern is real critical. In other words, when the wing reaches up at maximum angle of attack and you get total separation, you get a stall, what kind of stall pattern is this? Is it stalling at the leading edge or is it stalling at the trailing edge? That makes a real big difference. And you can tell by just taking a look at the catalogs on the airfoil sections immediately what it's all about and what, which one will give you the best results. Uh, 
Another critical thing you'd like to know is what is the pitching moment of the airfoil section? How bad of a pitching moment does it have? A maximum uh, CL that you can possibly obtain. Uh, the more CL you can obtain out of the airfoil section, the lower you can land the airplane for a particular wing area or for a given amount of landing speed, you can reduce the size of the wing, which then, of course, reduces the weight and reduces the drag too. Let's take uh, the term CL and look at it a little bit closer, exactly what we're talking about on that. Uh, again, for those of you who maybe aren't real familiar with this term, it's a lift coefficient and it defines the relative percentage, you might say, or portion that the airfoil section can actually lift if all other things are equal. You, you primarily use it in a formula. The lift is equal to the CL of the airfoil section times the density ratio times the wing area times the velocity squared over 391. If the velocity is described in miles per hour, this is a nice, beautiful little equation to use. And this density ratio here is one if it's at sea level and it gradually gets lower and lower below one as it goes to higher altitude. The textbooks will tell you exactly what this is and how to use it. But you can see that this factor here, if all other things are equal, the area is the same, the speed's the same, the density ratio is the same, you will get more lift if the CL is higher. So obviously the thing you'd like to do is go to the highest CL you can get out of an airfoil section. A very good way that this is presented is in a CL versus alpha curve. This will be the CL lift coefficient. This is the angle of attack of the airfoil. You'll primarily see a line drawn like this and it'll hook over and start coming down. This particular point here will be defined as the stall angle of attack or th this re also represents the maximum CL. A lot of airfoil sections will get you uh, CLs of 1.6, 1.8, sometimes even a little higher than that with no flaps on it. If you put the flaps down, of course, you can increase the maximum CL, and we'll cover that in a lot more detail. But what I was talking about before is, is the stall break. It's this portion right here that you want to take a good look at. In some airfoil sections, this break literally comes straight down and then continues out like that. That airfoil section of 230-12s or 230-15s, the whole 230 series, all have a stall pattern like that. And that, to me, is very, very bad and very poor. The reason is that once you get near this, once you get near your maximum CL at a particular given angle of attack, let's say 16 degrees, and you go to 16 and a half degrees, whammo, you lost it. I mean, that wing will stall immediately and you think you've lost all your lift when in reality you probably only lost 20 percent of the lift of the wing but that isn't the way the pilot feels and boy you think you've just lost everything so what you'd like to have is instead of something like that you'd like to have a stall pattern ideally that would just go almost straight across and then down because this means when you got to 16 degrees and you started to get a little separation a little breakdown of, of lift and kept bringing the nose up to 17 18 19 20 degrees you really did not lose any of your lift capabilities and the airplane sits there vibrates much as along but keeps flying uh, i don't really know of any airfoil that has an absolute flat one across there so you really won't ever find that but you can get something that's pretty nice and even to it unfortunately sometimes when you get that you also have a lower maximum one but if this is important, this is what you want to do when you look into the catalogs, when you want to look into the NASA reports, and when you want to look into, say, for example, a book of theories of wing sections. This is probably the best one you can obtain now. This is all based upon a NASA report that was published in 1945 called uh, uh, TR 824. And in there, this has almost all of the NASA airfoil sections in there, the four digits, the five digits, and uh, the laminar airfoil section, six series section. So you want to look for things like that there, but again, you want to know what the stall break is. You can tell by looking at the CL versus alpha curve as to whether the wing has stalled at the leading edge or whether it's stalled at the trailing edge. If it's gradual across there, you can be quite certain that the wing had a stall pattern whereby as it approached maximum lift, that the air flow actually separated. Now, this, again, this is not the boundary layer, turbulent, it's already a turbulent boundary layer by the time you get back here, but the air is actually separated, and as the air flows this way, some of it turns right around and goes back up the wing and starts reducing the lift of it. If it gradually sta starts in the back and starts working its way forward, you'll get this nice curve. 
If on the other hand, it separates here in the leading edge for whatever reason and starts to separate there, boy, all of the wing is gonna go and go right now. Besides the stall pattern on the wing that you wanna look for and maximum CL you wanna look for on the thing, there may be a couple other things that are critical to you. For example, pitching moment. What does the pitching moment mean? Well, in all of these catalogs and all these books, you will find that every airfoil section has an aerodynamic center. And at subsonic speeds, this aerodynamic center just about always exists at around quarter chord. It might be 23%, it might go back as far as 26%, and in some cases it's even above the airfoil section, but those are oddball airfoils. But the general ones, it's right around on the chord, and it's right around quarter chord of the wing. At this point, you can then assume that all lift and all drag is acting through this particular point, plus a twisting moment, a pitching moment. If the airfoil is camber, you will almost always have a pitching moment that tries to make the nose go down. What, what it really means is that the average pressure over the whole wing is somewhere is behind the wing. The center of pressure of everything is behind this quarter cord and is tending to twist the wing over on that quarter cord. Way, way back in the 20s and so on, uh, they thought it was real good to publish data about lift coefficients versus alpha and also publish where the center of pressure was. But since the center of pressure would always move, it became very difficult for the designer to use this information, to know right where the center of pressure is. Whereas on the other hand, if you get information about the aerodynamic center and the pitching moments, then you can very nicely know how to use it. You assume all the loads are right through the quarter cord or your aerodynamic center, and then you determine how much pitching moment you have in there. When you have a lot of camber, you generally will get a lot of pitching moments. And this means the wing is lifting a lot, but the center pressure moves back a lot. This is not bad if you want a modestly oh, high-speed airplane, something that's in the 100 to 150 mile an hour range, a uh, fair degree of pitching moments won't hurt you at all. It gives you a real good max CL, it allows you to land a lot slower, it works out good there, but your tail has to be sitting there and balancing out this pitching moment. On the other hand, if you have an airplane that's really quite high speeds, something you want to get up in the three, maybe 400 mile an hour range, then you don't really want to have that much pitching moment in there because your tail is going to be having to lift down with a fairly good force and this will cause you additional drag that you'd prefer not to have. So therefore, you might want to then use a uh, relatively low cambered airfoil section for the high speed airplane. You don't get as much max CL out of it, but you'll have to put up with the penalty of, of that for the benefits that you'll get from it. One thing incidentally, that it's sort of uh, unique and, and uh, you should remember particularly if you want to work on airplanes such as flying wings or, or even canard sections. <coughs> and that is, if your airfoil has camber to it, if this is the mean line and it has camber, as I said before, you're going to get pitching moments to it. But you can change the trailing edge. You can reflex it. And this becomes a very powerful tool in changing your pitching moment. So flying wings practically all use reflex airfoil sections where the trailing edge curves up and the actual mean line curves here too. And what this will do, it changes. As the wing builds up at higher and higher angles of attack, the center of pressure doesn't continue to move back. It actually starts to move forward and you'll get a pitch up condition to it or as what might be called a stable airfoil section. And so therefore, when you are using a flying wing, you have no tail, you must have make sure the wing itself is stable, you have to go into a reflexed airfoil section. Um, just, just as sort of side information, you can take any airfoil you want and draw the cord line, and if the mean line curves up but then crosses back over and goes underneath the cord line at a distance of one-eighth of the cord from the trailing edge, no matter how much curvature you have in here, you will make that a reflex section and it will be a positive airfoil on it. This isn't necessarily a very important thing on normal airplanes that you have with the tail in the back. In fact, even on canards, you don't have to worry too much about it. But if you're dealing with a flying wing, don't ever anticipate trying to make a flying wing operate with an airfoil section that isn't reflex, that isn't stable. You cannot tolerate it with a pitching moment unless you have a center of gravity that is three or four cord lengths below the, the aerodynamic center. In some cases, let's take for example um, a sailplane, a glider, high performance sailplane. 
There is one other factor that you might want to have. You might want to have the maximum L over D of the airfoil section itself. We can come back and take a look at a plot here of this time the drag coefficient. Well, let's make this a CL over here and a drag coefficient over here. We can plot what the drag is at different CLs and we will end up with a curve that will look something like this. If this is zero here for a zero drag coefficient starting and zero CL over here, if we draw a line and wherever it gets tangent to it, this is the ratio of how much CL we have for how much drag coefficient we have. The bigger the CL versus the CD, the bigger the lift to drag ratio is. This is not important for an airplane that flies real fast. It's not important even for an airplane that wants to land slow like a stole type of aircraft. But if you want good soaring capabilities, or for example, maybe on a twin engine airplane where when a single engine fails on you and you have to fly on the other engine, you now want to be able to have the maximum amount of lift you can out of that airfoil with the minimum amount of drag. So your ratio of max CL over CD is, is important. There are airfoils that are designed, and, and uh, Wartman, for example, over in Germany, designed a series of sailplane uh, airfoil sections that went ahead and purposely modified this curve to be something like this, and he would end up with a real nice high maximum L over D ratio for the thing. Uh, this is important in some cases, but not in, in all cases. You have to understand what your design is aiming for, what are the things you're trying to optimize for, and then decide to uh, choose which one you want to go with. Let's go over a couple of these sections that we have in here. Again, this theory of wing sections is an extremely good book that will give you a lot of technical data on it. It doesn't tell you which airfoil is best, it doesn't tell you which one you should use, but it has all of the pertinent data and information you want to have about the profile of the airfoil, the pitching moments, the max CL, the minimum drag, and so on. Dr. Wartman, who unfortunately just passed away about a year ago, uh, did publish a catalog, this is done in 1972, uh, from Stuttgart University. And in here, he has a series of airfoil sections that he has developed that are very good laminar airfoil sections. I would say they were primarily developed for sailplanes. Uh, they're modestly thick, they have a modest amount of camber to it, but they are really good low drag airfoils. Uh, I remember him telling me that he never intended any of his airfoil sections to be used on a wing that maybe even was a riveted wing uh, with metal skin on it because you could not get it smooth enough. He felt that a composite structure or a metal wing that was really flush riveted and filled so that's very smooth. So these sections are good, they're really good low drag, good high CLs, good stall patterns in many cases in here, but you have to be sure that your surface is done right. Now most time what you'll see is a lot of data about the top of the wing being laid out just so to get this laminar airfoil. But the bottom of the wing also is going through the air and it has to have drag reduction too. But you can see if you have a certain angle of attack, the air on the bottom is generally accelerating anyways as it goes around. It has a good positive pressure gradient there for laminar flow, whereas over the top it's sensitive and as it speeds up it can very quickly get to a point where it has to slow down. So the top is more critical to design, but both are equally as important when you're working with it. So therefore, the top of the wing should be smooth, but the bottom itself also has to be very critical to go with. Horner also came out with a series of books. Uh, these are still available uh, by his wife in New York, and we will have that information here as we're to order it. He has a book called Fluid Dynamic Drag, and he has one on Fluid Dyn Dynamic Lift. This not only covers airfoils itself, although not nearly as much detail as some of these other books would do, but it gives you a good idea of what flaps and what some of the other uh, characteristics in improving the lift of the wing will be. Uh, for those of you who don't have it and you're seriously considering working on designs of the airplane, those three uh, publications are ones that I would recommend very, very strong to you obtain. Let's talk a little bit about the thickness of the airfoil itself um, and what's the advantage of one way or the other. It's quite obvious that if you use a thick airfoil and you want to make a cantilever wing, for example, with the spar built in there completely, you will be able to put a very big spar and therefore a relatively light one or a very relatively strong one. So the thicker the airfoil, the better it is from a structure standpoint. However, the normal consensus opinion is that the thinner you make it, the less drag you will have. Well, this is true maybe if you're really dealing with 
high-speed airplanes, very, very high-speed airplanes, and you're working on a racing aircraft, for example, or if you are going supersonic. That's a whole different ballgame there. But let's talk about just general aviation. Yes, as the airfoil gets thinner, you will reduce the drag somewhat. But the difference between going from, say, a 18% thick wing down to a 10% thick wing is only maybe 4 or 5 or 15% drag reduction at all. So, for example, if we would take a look at a 18% thick wing and take a look at a 10% thick wing. Now, you're going to have to take my word for it that that's 10% and that's 18% because you can see I did it with this calibrated chalk here. But in this particular case, we now have a great deal of room to build a spar. And we may end up with a drag coefficient. I'm talking about the minimum drag coefficient, a CD. Oh, maybe of, uh, let's take the fact that this is a four-digit series airfoil on it, and it has a reasonably clean wing. It doesn't have a whole bunch of rivets and other protrusions sticking on the surface of it. We may end up with a drag coefficient of zero, zero. Uh, if it's 18%, probably around a nine. If it's 10%, again, we'll make that 18%, and we'll make this 10%. These are just relative numbers. These aren't exact numbers on the thing. But you might get down to 0, 0, 008 even. N not much lower than that. So the difference in being able to use a relatively thicker airfoil section is something to really consider important. Above 18%, the drag will start to increase a little bit faster. But anywhere from like 12% uh, to 18% is relatively the same. 15%, that's a real good number to use. This is why you find a lot of general aviation airplanes, uh, home built as well as factory made airplanes, using sections of 14, 15, 16 percent thick. Uh, you don't have to worry about trying to get into real, real thin sections. Again, unless you're looking for the very, very maximum benefit you can get in drag reduction with this thing. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact that a thick airfoil section is not only good for the structures, but as, as a lot of times uh, uh, try to be told the fact that it has too much drag on it. That isn't really true. What's more important is to have the wing surface very smooth, and what's really very important is to use the laminar airfoil section itself, a low drag airfoil section. The newer ones that are coming out, the uh, natural laminar flow sections, uh, they're even better designed than the original 6 series, and they will give you even better drag reduction. But again, the surface has to be smooth. It has to be relatively clean all the way around. So what we would do is take a look at these NASA charts and see exactly what they tell us and how we can read them. The first one we have on here is a four-digit series, a 4415. Up in this corner here, you have a little bit of a drawing of what the airfoil section looks like. And you see right here is a little dotted line. What that is showing is a split flap on the airfoil section deflected about 60 degrees. Over on this side, we have a plot of the lift coefficient versus angle of attack. The first series right in here shows what the lift coefficient is, how high it will go for different Reynolds numbers. These little symbols define the different Reynolds numbers that the airfoil is tested at. This curve right here is also a plot of the lift coefficient versus angle of attack with that split flap deflected 60 degrees. Now you can see what the stall pattern sort of looks like. This one's a pretty good one. Comes on up here to a value of around 1.2, 1.3, and then gradually starts to fall off. As the Reynolds number picks up, it can actually go up a little bit higher. With the flaps down, the lift coefficient in this particular case gets up to around 2.8. You got to remember what they're saying now. This is what they call section lift coefficient. This is the lift coefficient at the various angle of attack of a wing that had a span that goes from one side of the wind tunnel to the other side. So in other words, like a wing of an extremely long aspect ratio or infinite aspect ratio that it would go. A little lower on the chart here is the pitching moment at quarter cord versus angle of attack. On the other side, you see a plot here now. This is of the drag coefficient versus the lift coefficient. And you can see that it has a gradual parabolic shape to it, a curve to it, so that at various lift coefficients, the drag can be determined in here. This curve represents what it would be what they call standard roughness. This is where you actually have a relatively rough surface, almost like gluing sandpaper to the leading edge. It's a case where you absolutely trigger off the laminar uh, boundary layer and make sure that it's turbulent almost the entire quarter of the wing. 
Incidentally, a four-digit or five-digit airfoils, if they're made very, very smooth, they will have laminar flow, oh, sometimes way back to 15%, and in some cases even 18%, but nothing like the low-drag airfoil sections would have. Again, the variations of these curves are for the different Reynolds number. Here is the plot of the pitching moment versus the lift coefficient. Now, if we will take a look at other airfoil sections, this is the four-digit series, and then we'll take a look at a five-digit series and the laminar airfoil sections. Now we have here the five-digit series, the 230-12 section. Again, you can see what the airfoil section basically looks like. And here again, we have the plot of the lift coefficient versus angle of attack. And here is what I was talking about before. It can come on up to a pretty nice value, relatively high, 1.6 but then it drops almost instantaneously. With the very slightest increase of angle attack, the lift coefficient drops immediately and you have the very severe stall pattern to it. A nice thing about this airfoil on the other side of the coin is the fact that it has a pitching moment that's nearly zero. It's very, very low. Even though the airfoil has uh, a modest amount of camber up in the leading edge. Uh, this is a case where that mean line gets a little bit of reflex in it and gets to the point where it has very little pitching moments to it. In this case here, we have now the plot of the drag coefficient versus lift coefficient. Again, these are for different Reynolds numbers, and here it is for standard roughness. In this particular case, this airfoil section, this five-digit section, doesn't have much lower drag coefficients than what a four-digit series is. Both of them are about the same. Uh, it has a pretty high CL. The problem is you really can't use it. Even though the CL is high, the stall pattern is so great, so sharp, that nobody can operationally use that section to the maximum because just before you get to maximum CL, you go one little bit further, you stall. So what you normally have to do, like on a Bonanza, it has that type of wing, you have to put stall strips or all sorts of warning devices to tell a pilot, don't go any further, you're going to stall and it's going to stall rather quickly for you. So the sad part about having good CLs like this, max CLs, is the fact that you really can't use them because of the bad stall pattern. All right, now let's take a look at the uh, 6 Series laminar airfoil section the 64 to 15. Here again, we have the view of what the airfoil section cross section looks like with the 60 degree split flap on there. Here again, we have the plot of the maximum lift coefficient capabilities versus angle of attack. Here it is for different Reynolds numbers unflapped, and here it is with the flaps deflected. The stall pattern with the flaps deflected is a little bit sharper without the flaps deflected is not quite as good as that old 4415 we had looked at before, but still pretty good, not too bad at all. A modest pitching moment as it goes across here. Over on this side where we have a plot of the drag coefficient versus lift coefficient, we see the typical type of thing you have on a laminar airfoil section, what is known as the bucket. This is the standard drag versus lift of the airfoil after it has gotten through separation, but before it gets to that, before the boundary layer Sep uh, goes into the transition point and goes into turbulent boundary layer. The drag is quite low and it reduces here. This is the little bucket. So the best place to be able to design the airplane to operate using this airfoil section is right in this region here. This is what you should have for cruise condition. When you're, of course, coming in for landing, you're going to be at high CLs, much higher CLs, you're going to have much higher drag, but you're not really too concerned about the drag when you're landing. This it is what it is with the standard roughness. This is it, what it is if it's nice and smooth. Here's the pitching moment again, just a modest pitching moment, not too bad at all. This is very, very typical of what you'll see with the laminar airfoil sections. This one has a camber value of two, which means that the bucket here is somewhat close to the zero CL line, lift coefficient line. The higher the camber, the more that bucket will shift off into the next section. However, as it does that, now yeah, this is a 018 section. Here's a 418 section. So you can see how it's shift from no camber to the 4 section. And we're back to 21. Let's take a look at this 418 section. This means that the bucket has slipped over to the side. That means you can go to a higher CL and still have the drag bucket. But once you pass it, the drag starts to run up pretty fast. This is good maybe for a sailplane design, but it's not necessarily something you want to use on a real high speed type airplane. In summary, as I said in the beginning, the selection of the airfoil for any design 
is not necessarily the most important thing, but it is really quite critical. You can really definitely affect the performance of the airplane if you make the right choice. What you're primarily looking for, again, is one that will have minimum drag, because no matter what kind of airplane, the less drag you have, the better performance you're going to have. But compromise that with a good stall pattern. Now, you can control the stall pattern somewhat by the wing design itself that we'll cover in another session. But first, but first, make sure that the airfoil section itself has a good stall pattern so that it stalls at the trailing edge so that the curve goes up and gradually fades down. Make sure you have that. Look for one that maybe has a modest pitching moment to it, not too severe, but if it is high and everything else is perfect, you can tolerate that. You'll have a little more download on your tail, but again, you can live with that. But if it's lower, then fine, that, that's a point towards it. And then, of course, if you can find one that has a reasonably good maximum L over D, so that the plot of lift coefficient versus drag has a position in it, this will give you a good rate of climb, give you a better rate of sink, and if it's a sailplane, of course, it'll give you real good performance along those lines. It's not difficult to study through these books, look at the different sections, see what they give you, determine what's most important for your particular design. What, what is in your design that you want to do to optimize, and then that's the way you sort of lean with it. We will cover a series of the different books here that I sort of recommend that you have. Uh, EA itself will have these books available in most cases, and I do strongly recommend, besides the tapes here, that you take a look at these books, go through them, use them as a reference, and as your design proceeds or your studies proceed, look at it very, very carefully.